everybody, Tacoma Comics here. This is take two. You won't see take one, but I kind of screwed up and I'm having all the books ready for this uh, video. Anyway, I'm here to do one of these mega mashups contest video entries. I got about one, two, three, four, five different contests I'm entering. Some of them are ending tonight, so I'm trying to hit them all before the, the deadlines are due. Uh, you know how it is. I got back from April vacation and been busy. Did a haul video the other day. Check that out if you like. Went live. I had three uh, live followers, count them, one, two, three. That was pretty cool. Never done live before on YouTube, so that was kind of cool. Um, but anyway, I uh, thought I'd do this one, so I'm putting a whole bunch of contest videos together. If any of the people whose contests I am entering are not happy with that, that's cool. Uh, I'm here to show the love for the community. I don't really worry about the, uh, the entries, but I'm going to do them all anyway and, and see how it goes. So first up is Symphonic Elk. Um, I honestly thought his uh, name was Symphony C Elk when I first read it, uh, but now I got that Symphonic Elk, and so all these people I'm entering definitely sub them up. I wouldn't be entering their contest if I didn't watch their videos and think they were uh, had some good content out there. So first thing he wants you to do is show a culturally significant comic. So I'm going to throw this one out there because I just picked it up today at Kino Kanaya um, Bookstore in Seattle. I'd ordered this about a month ago and it came in. I just never got it. This is the Japanese version of No Normal, which is the first trade paperback for Miss Marvel Volume 3 by G. Willow Wilson. Um, really kind of cool on the inside. A few uh, new bits of artwork that I haven't seen, like this over here. Um, but most of it is, is content that I've seen before, except obviously all the writing is in Japanese. You know, there's the cover. I think that's McKelvey for number two, and there's the last page of uh, issue number one. Um, so culturally significant, obviously this comic um, has a teenage Muslim superhero, which was pretty culturally significant in this country. Um, but, but I love it, not because of that, not in spite of that, but because uh, without retreading or without copying, reading that first issue is the closest I'd ever come to reading like a uh, you know, Spider-Man number one, the story of Peter Parker, is beyond being a Muslim female superhero, she's also an American teenager, and it does an amazing job, I think, of really pinning that down and bringing people together, I don't know if that sounds really corny, but kind of bringing that people together, the story together, that, you know, the, there's more that brings us together than divides us, that sort of um, cliche. And the fact that, you know, you see her in the first couple of issues there, arguing with her parents who don't want her to go out at night. She sneaks out the window. You know, what is more American than a teenager sneaking out of window, going to a party, defying her parents, but then getting to the party, realizing she's in over her head until the Terrigan Mists come over and give her powers, and then everything changes. So um, I think for a culturally significant comic, that would definitely be the one that, uh, that I'd put up there, especially one in recent years for sure. Uh, next thing he wants is for us to give a favorite comic that in our collection under ten dollars. I don't know exactly how much this one goes for. Um, this one's got some off-white pages and some definite dings on on the back. Um, you can see all right there. But uh, Spider-Man versus Wolverine came out in about eighty-eight, I think. I know this is one of my favorite comics because when I sold my comic collection in the early nineties. This is one they didn't sell, so this is not something that I've picked up in the last five years. This is something I've had for the last 25, 30 years, which, you know, is really cool. It's just this great story highlighting kind of the, the difference between the gruff, experienced Wolverine who's seen everything and done everything and this kind of dorky Spider-Man who gets him way over his head and they go to, like, uh, West East, East Germany and, um, you know, like during the Cold War time and... There's spies and intrigue and death and uh, this kind of like Wolverine versus Spider-Man thing going on. Um, you get this great shot here after a lot of stuff has gone down. And you see Wolverine is just meditating through it all. And Peter Parker is tossing and turning and can't sleep and can't deal with what, what's been going on. Um, here at the end, Wolverine has to kill Charlie, who's actually a, a female spy. Um, double agent or something I can't quite remember. Um, switch back to this color here and they show him doing the deed and then spider-man you know is there and is like what did you do and he's like don't bother me kid i know what i'm doing it's beyond you and all that sort of stuff so just a, a great story really well wit written um you know and i don't know any of these guys so february 87 sorry 
James C. Owsley was the writer. Mark Bright was the penciler. Um, you know, Peter Scotese, colorer, Bill Oakley, letterer. And so you get to Anne Nocenti, editor, and Jim Shooter, editor-in-chief. I just, I didn't know any of the people on this. But uh, definitely one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite books uh, that's, you know, I, I see it from time to time, and it gathers a little bit of money, but it's not like a major book that's that's getting tons and tons of uh of cash on eBay. So there you go. And the other thing Symphonic Elk wants us to do is to shout out um, a YouTuber that might need some help with some subscribers, uh, Gills311. I'll put his uh, information down below. Uh, new guy, he's just reaching 100, which I just reached um, a couple months ago, 100 subscribers. Really good content. I just started subscribing to him recently. Uh, go check him out. All right. Next contest that often. <laughs> uh, Guy by the name, another new one that I just started watching was uh, Glue Jays 88 and the only question he has for his contest uh, is why I should win over Larry, and Glue Jays will tell you I should not win over Larry. Larry should absolutely win this contest. He brings a lot more to your channel than I do, um, so if I win, I'll be glad to take the prize, but uh, I should not win over Larry. Uh, moving right along, um, Doomsday Comics. Doomsday's got some great stuff out there. I've been chatting with him a little bit. Uh, he wants us to create a superhero, and I am not going to create a superhero. I'm going to show you a superhero that my son created, and I hope this works. And my son put out this comic two years ago, actually, so it's, it's been a while. Um, he's been working his character, but being a young kid, 10 years old, he's all over the place with his artwork and his, you know, just writing down makeup Pokemon universes and makeup Star Wars characters and just, you know, Dragon Ball Z, drawing all the, the, the crazy hair on the Dragon Ball Z characters and learning that style and just, just, he goes on and on and on and on. So he can't stick to one thing, which is great. You know, he's 10 years old, he shouldn't. But the first comic that he drew and the first superhero he made was Super Death. And there's Super Death right there. You can see he's made of bones, legs askew, he's got a ball of fire in his hand and, uh, Shadows in one side, kind of sp sort of spidey eyes. Um, there's the Super Death logo right there. So Super Death was actually the name that was on a comic in um, one of the Captain Underpants books. It was one of the comics that George and Howard were reading. So my son took the word Super Death and made it this whole character and this whole thing. And you know, the only thing that can defeat Super Death, since he is dead, he's like an animated robot zombie is an army of the living. So his, um, even though he's a good guy zombie, his uh, nemesis are people who are actually alive. Those are the, his like weakness is, is the living. So I thought it was kind of cool my son came up with that. Uh, so I'm just gonna read from the back of this. Uh, Super Death, his origin is a homeless child named Tyler Post. He died of pneumonia and the government decided to bring him back with his bones as a robot. His powers and abilities include a rocket powered flight Fireball Blasts, Martial Art Skills, and Sword Skills. In case Sword Skills are not Martial Art Skills. So um, that's Super Death for you. Uh, I did do a little thing with my son where we emailed Scholastic and made sure we had the copyright that we were allowed to use the name Super Death. And he said, sure, it's, it's not that part of the book wasn't copyrighted, just the book in general. So we were allowed to take Super Death and run with it, which we did. So Doomsday, I hope that, um, I hope that satisfies you. And then uh, C. Woodard, 19, who's also got a great channel and great comments, uh, great haul and great comics out there. Go definitely sub him up. C. Woodard, 19, uh, I watch a lot of his stuff. He, he actually reads a lot of the same um, indie stuff I read, or at least non-Big uh, non 2 stuff. He's always name-dropping some, some comics that I like to read. Uh, he wants to know five underrated artists or artists that should have be better well-known. So... Um, I'm going to start off with Wendy Peeney from ElfQuest. This was one of the first uh, first real big name indie comics. It started like in 78, 79, and you know, they're wrapping up now with like their 10th um, different volume in the series, but it's all under this this quest, this elf quest. There's a basic same group of, of elves going through it, and just uh, it's beautiful artwork. She started doing this. Um, these portraits on the back of the, the first comics. Um, some of the first American comics to really use uh, manga kind of style and influence. And you can look at the size of the eyes here. Um, you know, they're kind of looking a little 
sad or glazed over there. There's a, a better example in issue one which I, or three, which I have here. Um, yeah, if you look at their eyes there, right? And definitely manga influence. When the first time you saw American um, artists doing that, uh, more of those portraits, there's Rayek. I just want to show you, all, all the originals were black and white, and I just thought um, some of the line detail and the, the style that she was doing here and invoking was just really awesome. If you've never read ElfQuest, sometimes it gets maligned as a, a goofy comic or a kiddie comic, and it, it really isn't. It's a really great comic. Um, second uh, artist, underrated artist for Sea Woodard's Contest, uh, or I don't even know if underrated is the right word, not as well known or not super popular, but Gabriel Rodriguez from Lock and Key. And if you look at this, this is issue number one. Um, just check out the detail on that house. He actually used a, a house and drew up architectural plans, which apparently messed with Joe Hill's uh, storytelling style because he got so into like the house itself, it didn't fit the story as it was written. Um, I don't know if that's uh, apocryphal or if that's a dead true story, if you may be telling it right, but uh, some absolutely just beautiful artwork here. He's got a new series out um, where he's the writer and artist, um, Sword, Sword of Ages, which is pretty cool. I'm not loving it. I'm up to issue two. I should be getting issue three soon, uh, but just some absolutely like you know, you got this this normal stuff here. These two teenagers coming to their their teacher's house and talking to the wife, and then you can see that they've uh, already taken care of a couple of people in the back of the truck there. And just just you know, look at the the depth of that scene where your point of view is drawn. Um, really, really gorgeous, gorgeous art. Um, his his pers perspective, his line work, uh, his detail it, it's it's phenomenal. Uh, he did this one, uh, they, they kind of did theirs in volumes, so the second volume was called Head Games, and I just wanted to show you this, keep that open there, because I do want to get this tattoo one day. Um, one of the keys that I'm referred to in, in Lock and Key is uh, the, the head key, where it opens up the brain and shows you what's inside and allows people to climb inside, so this is the little kid, and you can see all the stuff that's inside his brain. And uh, it actually was the very last page of this issue where, sorry, I don't want to ruin the perfect condition of these really nice glossy ones. You can see he's used the uh, head key to open up his head. And then in the next issue, you get to see what's inside his head. And I just thought that was awesome. So I wanted to get a back tattoo like this with some changes on the inside actually illustrating scenes from my life and my kids and my family and my hobbies but uh also putting a lot of that stuff in there because i just thought that was so super cool um just just amazing i mean you looked at that and said hey that's the inside of an eight-year-old kid's uh um brain uh, some more of the sorry for the glare there some more of the covers some really beautiful, beautiful work there. Um, so that's Gabriel Rodriguez. And then to switch to, I think I'm up to my third uh, underrated artist for C. Woodard. My third um, artist would be Gabriel Hernandez Walta, Walta who uh, did the art for the Vision series by Tom King, who probably everybody knows by now. Um, and he's just an amazing artist. I mean, it's like... It's, they're trying to be so normal, but they are so incredibly creepy. Welcome. <laughs> what does it say? Hi, may we help you? Um, and it just doesn't go. So the whole, the whole, if you've never read this, absolutely stop watching my dumb video. Go go read this. Um, but it's just all about this family trying, trying, trying to be normal and live normal existences. Um, and they just can't. And you get these little, like... Uh, glimpses of that. I mean, you know, kids fly to school. That's not normal. That's not going to work. Um, yeah, I just look at him sitting up in bed worrying, contrasted with him going off to uh, work the next day, and saving the world with the Avengers or whatever it is that the Vision does on a daily basis. Um, I think, no, that's not the end. That's the end. 
vivid vision gets stabbed right there. And that is just, I really wish there was not the totally awesome Hulk advertisement there. Let's just look at this part. Absolutely sick. Um, really great. And then, you know, mom comes in and is fighting this, this bad guy. I can't remember his name. And so is the younger brother. Um, mom ends up killing him. And then right at the end, see that mom's going crazy trying to hold it together smashes his head in blood's everywhere and what does the very last panel say don't tell your father classic americana right there just a little bit more of that so i want to highlight too that the um colorist on this is jordi belair who God, she's everywhere as a colorist, but you, you know you really need to uh, really need to check out any book she's on. It's going to be visually stunning. Sorry, this side. So you look at uh, Victor Vision. Is it Victor? As he just melts through the uh, hallway there into nothingness. I thought that was really cool. Just a lot of little stylistic things. How frightening is that? Not Jessica Jones. I always do it the wrong way to the camera here. And all she keeps repeating is mother, mother, mother. Just really, really grand stuff. And, you know, look at the colors here from Jordi Belair, too, to go with the uh, the artwork that Gabriel Hernandez Walta does. Just some really, really crazy stuff. Let's see if there's anything else in this particular issue that stands out. The, the writing here, but I, I don't want to highlight the writing because the contest is underrated artists. So I'll just show you this last page here. She's been sent a cell phone video showing her bearing that bad guy and she's being blackmailed and just kind of like to be able to draw a cell phone, make it look realistic the way it's, you know, a video on it would look is pretty cool. So next artist that I wanted to pick is Vanessa Del Rey who did the art on a book that Jordi Belair still did the colors for but also wrote and that is Redlands. Um, this is the foil version variant for number one. Um, I think it's exactly the same except for the, uh, the foil there so I don't know what this book is about and I, I mean that in the best way like I've read the first six issues first volume I'm not sure I've got to dive deep in the story I'm not sure I, that I understand the whole thing um, definitely witches and, and feminism and, and a whole bunch of brutal stuff going on there it's really cool just look at that and that tree on fire that's really well done very dark book and I, I mean that both literally and figuratively so you know her colors come through again with Vanessa Del Rey's art. A very distinctive color palette that really adds to the, the gloom and mystery and, and macabre of the story. Macabre feeling the story. You can't say macabre of the story. You can look at the, the line works on the door here. Just just really great stuff. So if you haven't read Redlands, the, the art is amazing. I'm switching colors here, but we're still in a dark greenish pattern now light shining behind the sheriff here very very cool stuff so definitely uh vanessa del rey should be getting more love from people and the last artist that i got picked out here um and i'm just going to show covers here because i know i'm taking a long time emma rios uh i'm going to highlight her work on pretty deadly this is actually upside down that's what i love about this so well done that unless you read, you know, the logo here pretty deadly, you think it's upside down, you think it should be that way. Um, and it really is. not she's just gorgeous. Jordi Belair happens to be the colorist on this as well. Uh, let's just show you some covers that Emma Rios did. Absolutely gorgeous. Really, you know, extensive and, and different. It's not like they're all the same. You know, just compare compare those two that's the same artist right there that's just to me that's just gorgeous and it talks to a really really talented team they're finally coming out with the next volume of this they've done two volumes so far i think 11 or 12 issues so i'm really excited for that boom 
actually should go back and read it. I haven't read this in a couple of years. And one more right there. All right, so uh, C. Woodard, there are your five underrated artists. Now let's just finish this off. And my friend Comics with Bueller uh, met this guy at Emerald City Comic Con. He actually recognized me, which is pretty cool. Um, and check out his videos, man. This guy's awesome. He does he gets sign language interpreters. Um, there's <laughs> videos uh, for people, videos about comics for people who hate comics <laughs> and stuff. And um, you know, first video I ever saw of him, he was attempting to open a, a, a do an unboxing with like a samurai sword <laughs> or something, which was pretty sick and crazy and, and just all in good fun. Um, so he has two questions and I'm going to have to cut to um, some edited footage in a second. He wanted to know, first of all, what was um, my favorite McFarlane cover? And I'm not a big McFarlane guy, but definitely Hulk 340, which I don't own, but would like to own, but we'll show you here now. And uh, his second question is, what is an 80s movie, your favorite 80s movie? And so Star Wars um, Empire Strikes Back would be my favorite 80s movie. But to me, that was a movie made in the 80s. And when I hear 80s movie, now I'm an 80s kid. I don't know if you can tell that I'm old. I'm not like, you know, this is 90% natural and 10% razor. But uh, I am <laughs> getting up there in years. Uh, but I am an 80s kid. So when I think of 80s movies, I think of, you know, um, war games and all the Brat Pack movies and... Um, Weird Science and all stuff like that. St. Elmo's Fire. Um, these, those are 80s movies. Mannequin is an 80s movie. It's something that had the feel of, of the 80s somehow wrapped up. And Mr. Mom was an 80s movie. So it's hard to um, pick just one of those because I love so many. But I think I'm going to go with Pretty in Pink. I actually had that poster, I think it's still in the basement of my parents' room back in New York. Um, absolutely loved that movie, totally identified with Ducky, um, was absolutely nowhere near as cool a dresser, as, as hip as he was. I thought I was, but but I wasn't. Um, and I uh, lived in a town that clearly had a lot of houses, like the rich kids' houses in, um, in that movie too. Uh, and I had Big Crush and Molly Ringwald, and um, so it was kind of toss up between Breakfast Club and, and Pretty in Pink, but I think it was Pretty in Pink, because um, it had Harry and Dean Stanton in, who's one of my favorite actors of all time. And finally, um, Molly Ringwald just this weekend in the New Yorker wrote a great article about looking back at some of those movies and how they were uh, decidedly sexist and racist and had some really big problems um, with them, but how they also, you know, how do you view art that... Uh, is troublesome. So it's kind of an interesting article. She's a great writer. Um, go check that out if you're so inclined. But definitely, I think I'll, I'll give Pretty in Pink my, my, my thumbs up for favorite 80s movie, though that'll change next week, I'm sure. So, Symphonic Elk, Blue Jays 88, Doomsday Comics, Sea Witter 19, and Comics of Bueller. Thanks a lot, guys. You're all excellent. Um, I appreciate you letting me uh, participate in your, your contest here, and uh, have a good time. This is Tacoma Comics saying goodbye.